as you came in this morning, some of you, as you came in this morning, some of you may have had the opportunity to pick up a copy of Vision Works. Our reading today is from that document. It's our first section and it's called, Our Grounding is the Interconnectedness of All Life. It is with a deep sense of awe and joy that we acknowledge the wonder of life in all its dimensions. As part of the organic whole, we experience life intimately, yet recognize that much is and may always be beyond our comprehension. We attest to the capacity to experience and create meaning and purpose beyond physical survival and material gain. This dimension of living, which may be referred to as the spiritual, reaches to the depths of our inner self and also transcends the self as we connect with others and with all life. We experience both freedom and limitations in our lives. Within that tension, we strive to engage with others as interrelated, self-reflective beings responsible for our choices. Moved by the interconnectedness of life, we choose as foundational the ethical and relational values we believe enhance life and strive to integrate these in the priorities we set and the decisions we make, both individually and as community. We are aware of the wide diversity of understandings of the concepts of truth, goodness, meaning, and spirituality, as well as the many promises, predictions, and truth claims of religions and philosophies. Within that diversity, we ground our choices in our interconnections and, with core values as a guide, explore and evaluate possibilities, embrace what we each deem helpful, and demonstrate respect for differences. We open ourselves to new understandings of life and relationships that challenge our previously held perspectives, while, ourselves of as while availing ourselves of aspects of our heritage that resonate with our values. Offered as wisdom for the journey. I'll just read the focus moment and you can imagine your connections with everyone. Into and through, over and about, within and beyond, above and below, we live and move and have our being circumscribed by an exquisite web of reality. The space you inhabit, the place I mark, the invisible everything that fills the space between us, both holding us together and keeping us apart. Bound by tethered, unseen truths, may we ever work to infuse them with beauty, seed them with care, test them with courage, and hallow them with our love. And should they one day burst into wavelengths our eyes can behold, may we find that our efforts have woven a gleaming golden halo of loveliness within which we have wrapped ourselves and are living our days.
all online. Uh, we made sure that we got that video rendered and uploaded to our website. So if you weren't able to watch it, it was the first section which was on the preamble. This is the first content section of the humors. Uh, but it's a good introduction to what the document itself is all about and why it's important to us at West Hill and where it came from. But this section is the first content section, as I said, and it's about uh, our interrelatedness, about our interconnection and that groundedness and the interconnection connectedness of life that we speak about each Sunday as we come together. And so I'm going to go through it, and I apologize for the tedium of PowerPoint slides, uh, but I'm going to go through, through it section by section, as I will through most of this uh, project, so that I don't miss anything, and so some of the nuances are lifted up. You'll You heard what I said, right? I'll turn to this one. Okay? I just won't be able to use my hands quite so much. Okay, but everyone, you got what I was saying. All right, okay. So we're moving into the first substantive section of Vision Works. Um, I want to remind you, though, that when I speak on Sunday mornings, we call this a perspectives with that bracket around the S. And that's because it's just what I'm thinking about something that I talk about. And sometimes I bring you the thoughts of other people. But it only becomes perspectives when you add to it what you have to think about it. And that's what these three sessions are during the week. For you to bring your input to us so that when we pull our writing group together, their conversation will be enriched by what it is that you've had to offer. So it's, it's, I really hope that you uh, make yourself um, some time to reflect on it. And if you can't do that, the document, you can pick it up or you can get it from our website online. And you can write out what your thoughts are and send them in to us and we'll make sure that they get into that mix too. I want to read a reading from uh, Walt Whitman first just uh, to put us in some of the, the beauty and history of the conversation around this concept. As for me, I know nothing else but miracles. Whether I walk the streets of Manhattan or dart my sight over the roofs of houses toward the sky or wade with naked feet along the beach just in the edge of the water or stand under the trees in the woods, or talk by day with anyone I love, or sleep in bed at night with anyone I love, or watch honeybees busy around the hive of a summer forenoon, or the wonderfulness of the sundown, or of stars shining so quiet and bright, or the exquisite, delicate curve, thin curve of the new moon in spring. What stranger miracles are there? We're speaking today about the concept of awe, about how all of our interconnections uh, build that sense of awe. The word awe comes from the old Scandinavian ag, meaning, I don't know how to pronounce it, I just made that up, meaning fright, or from the old High Germanic agizo, meaning terror. The understanding of awe was always those things that we didn't know anything about, that we didn't understand, caused a sense of, Ugh! and that sense was translated into awe, a sense of not knowing, of fear, of things being beyond our control, of perhaps having their origins beyond the natural world in some world that we could have no control over. And so the sense of awe was of bigness and of fear and of majesty. We've tamed it somewhat, but some of the authors that I was reading this week as I prepared for this were recognizing that perhaps though we have a more contemporary understanding of awe, which is just about things that fascinate us, that we really, when we recognize how much impact we do have over the world and over things that we should stand in awe of that in the manner after which that word first came into being. To be terrified of the impact that we can have, of the change that we can bring about, of what the world might look like should we fully put our imprint upon every corner of it. That standing in fear of that would be the right way to relate. Francis, can you bring us the first slide? There isn't one? Okay. Well, look at that. All that typing I did twice. <laughs> okay.
Okay, well, it's the first section we're going to talk about. I'm, anyways, I'll speak first about a couple of these things about awe. Uh, Dr. Keltner, a psychologi- psychology professor at the University of Berkeley, talks about our reg- the emotions that we know, anger, fear, uh, these emotions. It's when you get beyond those into a deeper understanding of it that we get to the sense of compassion and empathy and awe. That's where those feelings reside. And that they are a significant portion of those major emotions that we usually feel. If someone says, how are you feeling? We generally respond with one of those simple understandings of our emotions. And if we were to spend some time in thought reflecting more deeply, we might get to some of those deeper ones. But we're so hell-bent on getting to the next thing we got to do that most of the time we just rhyme off some, oh, I'm happy, I'm great, everything's fine, you know. Or I'm sad, I'm upset. But getting to awe... That's a deeper conversation. And we don't generally hear that taking place, you know, in the grocery store lineup or in a brief conversation with a colleague on the way down to somebody else's office. So getting to the depth of that is part of what we want to do today. Jonathan Haidt talks about, or Haidt, I never know how to pronounce his name either. Uh, He talks about how acts of generosity can cause us to feel awe as we see someone perhaps acting in a heroic manner or acting in a way that isn't the norm, we're stunned into silence and we reflect upon it with a sense of awe. The books Chicken Soup for the Soul or the dozens and dozens, hundreds perhaps, maybe thousands of videos on YouTube that show people doing extraordinary things elicit a sense of awe in us. And so as we approach even the conversation of these things that we hope will compel us to live with goodness, with empathy, with a sense of justice and love, just considering the breadth of that is enough to make awe come alive in our hearts. The first segment of the VisionWorks document is part of the organic whole. We experience life intimately, yet recognize that much is and may always be beyond our comprehension. Being part of an organic whole, we talk about that each week, how we are so deeply interconnected. That beyond comprehension thing is a part that we stamp our feet about and we get frustrated. We don't want to not know. We want to know and we want to know intimately. And so we burrow into scientific research. We search and search the libraries and the internet. We want to find out things that have eluded our forebears. And we come pretty close on almost everything. But things change, and they have changed over time. Remember when you were in science in grade 7 and you learned what a solid was and a liquid and a gas. And then maybe in grade 11 or 12, you learned that the solid wasn't really so solid. It was really a bunch of molecules. And then you learned a little bit, maybe if you went on to university, you found out that the molecules were actually atoms and electrons. And then much later than that, you found out it's all just space. Our learning is adjusted as we grow, as we come to understand new things. And those kinds of searches, those quests are underway all the time. Our ability to engage in those quests is sometimes limited by the realities of our world, by the specialties into which we've uh, spent our time. But the understanding that we will not understand everything, that we cannot possibly get an answer for every question that will come to our minds, that when we have to learn to sit with, that lack of knowing, that not being prepared for whatever comes next. And as we recognize that we're connected with one another, the reality that we can't control what's happening because of those connections, none of us an island unto ourselves and so responsible for everything that laps our shore. We can't control that and so the next day is always a question. We attest to the capacity to experience and create meaning and purpose beyond physical survival and material gain. There's always uh, many people who speak to us about searching for the meaning in their lives, the quest for meaning, uh, looking for meaning, trying to find meaning. 
We speak of it as though it's something out there that we can get at at some point in our lives. You know, if we, if the right person shows up that can give us some insights, or we open the right book, or we attend to the right practices, that somehow that meaning will be disclosed to us, unfolded, and we'll be confident that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But meaning doesn't exist like that. It's not something out there that you can grasp hold of or come across when you round a corner one day. Meaning is something that we create, that we live in our lives as we build our lives. Finding meaning is a misnomer. Uh, it's the wrong way to come about it. We ha must create meaning in our lives, in our relationships, in the way that we approach the world. And so our documents address that. They challenge us to be about that, to look um, beyond the everyday understanding of where meaning might be and to find it residing deep within ourselves and finding a way to express that beyond that. The dimension of living, which may be referred to as the spiritual, reaches to the depths of our inner self and also transcends the self as we connect with others and with all of life. Inside and outside. The word spiritual I went into in some depth last week about how that word has become one that's sometimes challenging for some people because it senses this other dimension beyond the natural dimension. But I think that those things that we speak of that have no defined parameters can be understood as spiritual things. And so when we recognize that our relationships can develop our understanding of the spiritual and our deep looking into ourselves can develop that as well, then those two things combined strengthen our understanding. Those who wrote this document wanted to make sure that we recognize that we would find within ourselves and beyond ourselves challenging ways to live in this world. We experience both freedom and limitations in our lives, and within that tension we strive to engage with others as interrelated, self-reflective beings. In our world we have freedoms and limitations. We talked uh, some weeks ago, uh, I was talking about the tragedy of the commons, where when we come to a closed amount of resources, a, a set area in which we can live out our lives, uh, as small as a field or as large as the planet, when we each bring our own self-interest to it and seek to take from it what it is that we need, we soon deplete those resources. It's only when we act in communal ways, uh, responsible to one another, that we find that we can enhance the value of those resources and extend them for the good and benefit of all. The tragedy of the commons uh, has become a, a significant way for us to look at limited resources uh, on our planet as our population continues to grow, climate change continues to affect us, and the resources uh, we use, we start to recognize that they are limited and that economic growth is a model that cannot be sustained. And so recognizing our individual freedoms but our responsibility to the community is a significant part of living out who we are. When we come here and we engage in this community, we set ourselves within relationships that we trust, that we recognize, that recognize us as worthy. Within this space, within these relationships, we've been about that work of building relationships, of creating trust, of articulating community and what it's about. And yet we all live beyond this place in a world where that trust is sometimes eroded by so many different things, where isolation and protecting ourselves becomes primary. I heard, um, I think it was Scott and John talking about sharks earlier uh, this morning, about the number of people that are killed by sharks in a year is about five. The number of people who are killed by people in a year is dramatically higher than that, and how we shouldn't really be afraid of sharks, though Scott still swears he's not going to go swimming with them. But the number of people who are killed by people in a year 
because those numbers come into our homes on a regular basis, because we're constantly told about the people down the street who had a tragedy happen to them, because we're made aware of that through our news cycles over and over again, our fear of other people continues to grow to the point that some people are as afraid of other people as most of us are of sharks. So finding that balance in the ability to be isolated and understand our own, our own abilities to care for ourselves and fend for ourselves and our dependency upon community, finding the balance in that is a significant part of wrestling with being alive in this world and finding how to live within it. I wasn't expecting to read all of this. Moved by the interrelation of life, we choose as foundational the ethical and relational values we believe enhance life and strive to integrate these priorities we set and decisions we make both individually and as a community. I think I've already spoken to that. I'm, I think I've actually got my pages mixed up too. Anyway. I'm actually going to get rid of those things. Because it's just confusing me. And I'm not going to read it anymore because you're, you have it at your fingertips online. And I'll, we'll put slides on the screens for this week. The key element of today's piece is that interrelatedness and the awe. And it sets before us the challenge that we have to live by. And it's a challenge I speak about every single week when we come together. It's about recognizing that we have an impact on others. John mentioned how connected we are with individuals in this world. And we can live our lives out in this community. We could close ourselves off from the rest of the world. We could live our lives with our families, recognizing that smalls, the smallest unit of tribe that the world has ever known. We can care for and take care of their interests. And we can live our lives fed by a community that brings to us our food and our news and our information but closes us off in a little building we call home. There's a lot of people who do that and every now and then driving on the gardener watching those 23 cranes put up 23 new condo buildings. I try to imagine myself living in one of those little squares, one of those little cubes that's being created there for another family to move into, whether it's a family of one or two or three or five, to imagine living my whole life out within that confined area. It's almost impossible to do it, mostly because I don't like the idea of living in a condo, but because the idea of closing myself into a space with just one or two people to define everything I know about the world with just the people that are in that space with me goes against everything that I know as valuable and that can bring me strength and courage in this world. I don't want to be afraid of people. I want to engage them, to come to understand them, to help them feed who I am, to help them pull my heart to understand something different than what I knew before. Perhaps if we were to shake those condos up every now and then, just pick them up with those cranes and shake them so that people ended up in different rooms, you know, having to talk with somebody they'd never seen before, they might actually bump up against new understandings, new ways to see the world, new practices, new rituals, new languages even. I remember when one of our, the members of our congregation a couple of years ago, uh, the, uh, something in their, their building blew up and everyone in the building had to move out to another place to be. And they got to know each other in a way that they had never known each other before. They started talking and they created friendships. They'd walked by people that they found they really, really liked for years without ever speaking to them. But that transformer, or whatever it was that blew up in their building, brought them together in a new way. So I think sometimes that those cranes could just pick the building up and shake it, that we might learn something new. And so here in this place, though a lot of us look a lot alike and we come from similar backgrounds, none of us are the same. None of us bring into this conversation all the things that the other person knows. Although the conversation that we have in the course of a day, we sometimes never know that. Because it's always safe to talk about the things that we assume the other person is going to know and understand intimately. 
We all watch the same sports shows, right? So we can all talk about the scores. We can all talk about the players. We can all talk about something that everybody knows about. We tend to stay on that level of commonality so we don't have to get down into those other levels that could destroy the way we see the world, could challenge us to actually tear apart our world views and put something new into them, could actually press upon us the need for us to open ourselves to a new way of understanding. That's the part of this community that we need to get into, and that's the part that I'm hoping this conversation around Vision Works allows us to do over the next few weeks. Getting beyond the things that are common to us all and starting to risk speaking about those things that are damned scary. Those things about what we really like and what it is we're really afraid of. Those things about what it is that could move us to live differently or move us even to kill. What would be those things? How could we talk about them in decent company and still have respect for ourselves or still expect the other person to have respect for us? How can we talk about the things that we do that we're ashamed of Or how can we talk about the things that we wish we could do but are too afraid to try? Those kinds of connections, those kinds of relationships that can score themselves deeply by the truths that are manifest in them, those are the kind of relationships upon which a new world can be built because they are honest and they are sincere and they get beyond just that surface stuff that can numb us all into believing that everything is okay. I believe that this group of people, the group of people that has been wrestling this congregation beyond the traditional, beyond the safe, beyond what it was 10 or 12 years ago, into the shape it's in now, I believe that group of people has the capacity, capacity to have those kinds of conversations. And I think that when they have those kinds of conversations, that they can challenge others to have them too. I think if we practiced it in this place, if we got good at it, if we got comfortable enough with it, believe me, you'll never be totally comfortable, but if we got comfortable enough with it here, couldn't we maybe try it somewhere else? Couldn't we maybe raise a conversation that took us beyond the normal with family members that we never really talk deeply to, with people in the workplace who just do the same thing over and over and over again because it's on their job description, but they've never really thought about whether it's something they have passion for or whether the company is even making something that they can be proud of, to have conversations that make a difference in the world, not just in this place, but beyond. And I know for some of you I'm preaching to the choir. You're already doing this. Mel upsets her bridge group almost every time she sits down at the table because she raises those questions and she talks about things that aren't polite and she helps people recognize that it's important to do that. And so I'm proud of her for doing that and I know all of you can. Doing it and surviving it are two different things, though. So the practice of raising up those things that are challenging and offering them into a space to have a conversation about them and then being able to support that conversation as it hits its highs and lows without judgment, without anger, without arrogance, that's an art. And it's an art that we need to be teaching in this place. It's an art that must go hand in hand with the desire to create change in our communities, in our families, in our world. And so that's part, another part of who we want to become, an incubator for learning about who we can be and how we can change this world. One relationship at a time, one conversation at a time, one risk taken at a time. That's the work that I'm hoping that we can do. So we start on this theme of interrelatedness and then we dig deep down into it to find out exactly what our responsibilities are 
What are our responsibilities when it comes to how deeply related, connected we are to every living thing on this planet? How can they be anything but grave and limitless? May we find ways to discover our responsibilities and may we find ways to act within them with integrity, with goodness, with beauty, unbounded beauty, with care, and with courage. And may that be an element by which we come to be known as we converse and are ourselves convert head in those conversations to new understandings, new commitments, new ways of being in the world. Thank you. The papers? Oh yes, I, Scott's telling me I want to tell you about what the papers are. I think we kind of blew it with the papers actually, um, but John didn't know what I was doing and so the idea, the experiment as it is normally undertaken is that a group of people sit in a hallway or some plain place and they fill out that list of who they are. And then a group of people sits in front of something that draws them to a place of awe. And in the experiment, it's actually a skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex, which creates awe in them. And they fill out those papers. And the difference in the two uh, is, is supposedly considerable. But John, <laughs> before you filled out the first one, had you think about these multitude of connections that you have in the world and completely blew the experiment to pieces. So, but I'm going to see if there is something anyway. And the second one was supposed to be after you watched that amazing film, <laughs> which didn't translate very well. So I'm imagining that you're all just fabulous people, and I'm going to read that on those pages. But I'll let you know if I notice anything different next week. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, there are supposed to be questions there. So we have several versions of this PowerPoint for this week, obviously. Um, anyway, just the questions to think about. What, uh, what might you step into a relationship with? What kind of question might you open up in a relationship and risk by doing so? And what would it take to make you feel comfortable enough to do that? would tell you that before you can raise those questions you need to be given safe passage most of the time that's not going to happen though most of the time when you raise that kind of stuff with people safe passage just kind of closes right up that's the kind of world we live in but that's the kind of world we live in so it's the kind of world that we get to work with and whether or not we have safe passage there are things in our heart that need to be shared and need to be talked about. And whether or not we think that we'll come out of that conversation alive, we still need to put our words in there, get our hearts open so that we can share what it is that we know, so that we can be about raising the standard by which we want to live, raising the standards of love and compassion and justice, and raising the standards of relationship. So, safe passage or no, be about finding a place where you can take that step. And if you don't know how to do so, how, so if you don't know what comes after that, make sure you find a place like this where you can find out where those difficult conversations can be supported and engaged and we can make this world a better place. Go from this place in peace.